Hello, I am Suzanne Hilser Wiles, president of GGNA, and I am delighted to welcome you to the latest edition of our thought leadership series. If you have questions, please submit them via the Q&A button at the top or bottom of your screen. We won't have time to answer them today, but we will post responses on our website in the coming days. Today, I am joined by Janet Feldstein McKillop. Vice President for Development at Getty, where she has been for just over six years. Prior to joining Getty, Janet was the Director of Development at St. Matthew's School in Los Angeles. And before that, she served as a Senior Major Gift Officer at both Harvard and Stanford. I have had the opportunity to work with Janet throughout her tenure at Getty, and I appreciate both the creativity and steadfastness required to build private support at an institution with international renown, but very little history of fundraising. So Janet, so nice to have you with us today. Thank you so much, Suzanne. I love this series, so I'm honored to be one of your participants. Thank you. Oh, terrific, thank you. So could you start out by telling our listeners a little bit about the fundraising program at Getty and what has evolved since you first began there? Sure. Um, well, I think to start, I would I would touch on something you just said, which is it's an institution that's so well known, um, but fundraising is quite new. And actually, if I can take one step back for people on the webinar uh, who, who may not be familiar intimately with Getty, I work for the Getty Trust, as you can see on this slide, and the Getty Trust is actually the umbrella of four programs. It's the museum that everyone thinks of, both the center and the villa, which together are the museum. And also we have a conservation institute, a research institute, and our grant making foundation. So all of those together represent the trust, and, and I work for the trust. And as you said, it's an institution that's well known, probably you know, one of the most well known cultural or arts organizations in the world, but it's a young institution in and of itself. It was founded when essentially came to be when Mr. Getty died, which is not even 50 years ago. And the Getty Center that we think of is not even 25 years old. So maybe it's not surprising for that reason that fundraising is very new. We are a program in its nascence. And of course, the Getty came to be with a very large bequest, an act of philanthropy, uh, 50 years ago when Mr. Getty died. So in the beginning, fundraising you know, wasn't a thought at all. But my boss, Jim Cuno, came um, about a decade ago. And I think he realized that not fundraising, as we've talked about, on one level, even with an endowment like the Gettys, there's an opportunity to build additional revenue from fundraising and also community support. So that was Jim's vision. But when I came to the Getty, fundraising had really just begun, really, if anything, just a small infrastructure was in place. So as, as you know, because you've been here from the beginning, we have grown, I mean, we, we've evolved every day, just about. We have grown about threefold in size of our staff. We've added fundraising programs, developed priorities. We've begun to ask for major support. And then of course, there's the topic that we have today. Four years ago, we started a patron program. So that has been a big driver of our kind of community of support, our, our donors. And how many, could you tell folks how many positions you have in fundraising right now or in advancement as a whole? We actually have 15 positions because we are hiring. Right now. <laughs> I promise we didn't plan it. <laughs> uh, but, you should definitely get that plug in. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, we really have, we are growing and evolving, as you said, so much every day that we didn't, we didn't have need for major gift officers five years ago. We didn't have donors of whom we could make an ask. And today we now have fundraisers, we have people working in the patron program, which is our annual fund. So there are 15 positions today. And I think I was one of four when I came. Yeah. And I, I think um, you and I have talked a lot about this. One of the common um, misperceptions about fundraising at the Getty, because you have this large endowment, kind of why do you need that? But right. of course, most of the money 
actually goes out into the world to support all sorts of programs like conservation um, and you know around the world, some of which is really to run the programs that you described, um, but which have, of course, themselves their own vision and um, and and there are people who just love the Getty want to be part of that vision. Um, so. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, I mean, you you bring up sort of the past of fundraising and that's exactly it. When Jim hired me, there was a very clear conversation. You are not raising money to keep the lights on. That was the expression. And of course we don't need to, and almost certainly we'll never need to have private support to keep the lights on. In those early days, the idea was just around special opportunities. And I think a perfect example, you know, some of our colleagues who are on, on the call will remember the Dunhuang Caves exhibition that was in 2016. So it was not planned for in our operating budget, but it was a multi-million dollar undertaking because we had a huge installation on the plaza. We had galleries with objects that had been reunited for the first time since leaving China um, from institutions all over the world. And this was not a budgeted exhibition. And so the idea was things like this would happen. And instead of pulling resources from other places where it had been budgeted, we could raise private support. And as we talked about at the time, these are uh, these were projects that clearly had potential to be supported. In the case of the Dunhuang Caves, people who recognized the importance of that culture and bringing it to Los Angeles. It was a once in a lifetime opportunity. But again, going to what we're talking about today, we weren't going to kind of existing Getty family member. Uh, and when I say Getty family, I don't mean people with the last name Getty, people who were part of our community. <laughs> right. uh, because we didn't have a donor base, really. We had donors who had supported programs for probably over a decade by the time I came to the Getty, but those are um, those are programmatic support. And while some people on this call, I mean, we all know how these kind of affinity groups can be tricky to manage. I came in and really stayed at arm's length at best from those programs. So I didn't even consider those to be potential supporters for these major initiatives. We went outside. We looked to bring in new donors, but we had the problem. The next time an initiative came along, do you go back to that same small group of individuals who are still paying off a major gift in some cases? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what made you decide to build a leadership annual giving program? And what drove the structure you ultimately, um, you ultimately designed? So it's exactly that. We realized, I, you know, I feel that you and I were probably having conversations. If I started in 2015, we were probably talking that calendar year and the mm -hmm. idea of a donor pool. So early on, I knew I needed to take steps to build the donor pool, but I also needed to build kind of buy-in at the Getty. I think that's worthwhile for anyone on the call who's thinking about starting something different. It was two years that I was at the Getty before we actually launched the program because we needed institutional buy-in. We needed to sort of figure out what the program would look like, how it would be structured. As we said, I had a very small department, so I wasn't about to launch a membership program. We didn't have the infrastructure. We didn't have the staff. That would be a very, very big step into kind of raising support for the Getty. So we had to do something that wouldn't be controversial, that could be managed by a very small team and made sense for the culture of our institution. Uh, I think so it was really kind of what are the constraints and what are the opportunities? And the way we launched, I would say is, <laughs> Someone said to me, uh, we, we really went for it with the 1940s technology. We <laughs> literally sent letters to about 30,000 individuals, uh, inviting them to support the Getty, to become part of the Getty family, and to um, invest in new work that the Getty would do. So we made it clear that it wasn't about keeping the lights on, but rather through their support, they would get to know others who were interested in the work that the Getty does all of its work, not just the museum, but field work, conservation, et cetera. Um, and I wouldn't say it was an experiment, but it was an easy way to go out and see if there was interest. Uh, 
Yeah. So I think that's how we decided to structure it that way. It was within the constraints that we had, Mm -hmm. recognizing that we felt there were donors in the Los Angeles area in particular who would be interested. And I felt that, you know, doing it at the thousand and up, that's enough that it would be real support, that it would make a difference. You know, if you got a hundred at a thousand dollars, that's, that's a significant major gift, especially in terms of Getty giving at the time. But it wasn't so much that we had to do a ton of build-in, that we had to do advertising or marketing. The letter writing campaign is what worked at the time. (laughs) That's great. Well, and I, I think, you know, it's interesting for people to hear that you actually did think about does membership make sense for us? It doesn't. This is what fits in with our community. This is what we can support with staff resource we're likely to have. Um, And, you know, responding to a real interest. And, you know, I would also add that Janet had a real um, advocate in in one of her trustees who was then board chair, um, who really felt like there are a community of people who would like to be part of the Getty community in a more formal way. And we should give them that opportunity. Um, And I I think her advocacy was really huge and she was right, it turned out. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, and and we had our board chair and a, a second advocate who was the chair of the development committee actually author the letter that we sent out first. And to your point, we had spent a lot of time, I had introduced them to you, we had had a lot of conversations in advance. So we felt very secure because it can be controversial with Getty going mm-hmm. out and fundraising broadly, that we had leadership support internally. I think mm-hmm. my boss, Jim Cuno, really understood and bought into why we were doing this. That allowed us to feel confident going out. And in the letter, it said, this is not a membership program. The Getty is free and always will be free. So we really wanted to make clear this was an opportunity to invest and become part of something bigger, but it wasn't meant to be any way a membership program. Yeah. And um, and as you know, Janet really brings up the important point, the Getty is free. Um, and so, but because of their wonderful programs and the fact that it has been around for almost 50 years, you know, they, they build up these lists of folks, names of visitors, people who've been there, who signed up for newsletters. So they did have this pool, large pool of people who had expressed at least mild interest. <laughs> and, and the board members also really helped you think about who are the right target audiences for some of these things. I mean, that's, I will say the hallmark of this program, which is both it's one of its strengths and one of its challenges is the depth of investment that I have had as our vice president. You wouldn't think typically the the head of the department would be this deeply involved, but I spend a lot of time on this program still because it is our first foray into the community. It is Mm -hmm. the way that the majority now of our donors experience the Getty. And so we looked very carefully I reviewed those 30,000 names more than once, line by line. We identified individuals who should get a hand-signed letter from the board chair, from Jim Cuno in some cases. So we really tried to be as almost treating it like a major gift program because this was our first time talking about philanthropy to people, as you said, who had been in our database sometimes for years. They had made a gift. I mean, that's the craziest part is sometimes people made gifts to the Getty unsolicited and no one had a vehicle through which to follow up with them. So it answered that need. Sometimes people had made gifts of art, had donated archival materials, or as you said, they just were, they had made reservations to park time after time. These are people who we knew wanted to have a relationship with us. And, you know, it, it, it's not the 30,000 people joined, but there was a clear there was clearly appetite right away for for that, which also made it really fun to stay involved. So for those of us who do not live in Los Angeles, the whole uh, parking (laughs) (laughs) phenomena and and it's it's linked to leadership annual giving at cultural institutions. That's an entire, that's an entirely other episode. (laughs) 
You know, but Suzanne, I think yes, but if if people are on the call because they're interested in this, these are the types of details that we did put tons and tons and tons of time into. And as again, I, I said, you know, the level of involvement I had in what seems like, you know, easily a delegatable uh, mm -hmm. function, we had to think about how would people feel if they were $10,000 donors and they had special parking and it was full because that happens at the Getty. And so what would be, you know, would there be a phone number that people could call? And would we give special parking to 5K donors? That's a very big gift, but what if we had too many people sign up at 5K? So we spent, I mean, you might remember, I think over a year working on the brochure, working on the benefits at every level, what would we give a donor to be meaningful, to make it worth stepping from one level to the next, thinking about who we wouldn't solicit. We combed through to make sure we wouldn't be offending someone with an ask, um, which you know, there's so many little anecdotes I can share, but the prep work is almost the most important part. Well, you think it's the most important part until you launch and then, <laughs> then today is the most important day. Yeah. No, and I, I think you're bringing up something really, really important, Janet. I mean, we work with clients all the time and, you know, whether it's a membership program, an alumni association where they think, gosh, if I could rethink this. If exactly. I could do yes. This, right? That's and such so a you, good point. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. No, so you had this unusual opportunity and because you were you were responding to the need to create a pool, as you said, of people who are engaged and might become major donors and create a way in for members of the community who wanted a formal relationship with the Getty. You didn't have, you wanted to move forward, um, you know, thoughtfully, but you didn't have real urgency. So it gave you the True. opportunity to really work through some of these details ahead of time. Uh, yes. Um, and I think that, I mean, you raise so many great points because balancing urgency and thoughtfulness is crucial. Mm -hmm. I will say on the one hand, no, there wasn't urgency to keep the lights on, but I wanted this to happen. I wanted to make a mark. I wanted to show that I could launch this as there had been some, some elements of skepticism around this, but it's also I think really important to think about what's, as you said, if you get to create a program or if an institution is going through a major change, you get to, um, you get to set the tone of the program. And I didn't want this just to be a pipeline. I mean, that was the clear uh -huh. case to begin thinking about a pipeline building program. But we looked at not only our own opportunities and things we could give as benefits, but we looked at programs we knew were successful around the country. And what did they do? How did those participants feel? What were the ways they engaged? And you know, again, this year being <laughs> a whole nother webinar potential, how you keep people engaged. But we looked in particular, I think at, I think it was MFA Houston, MFA Boston, the Met. Uh, what was it like to be a patron at those programs? And what could we do to ensure that people felt special as a patron, not just as a potential major donor? You know, we see this as a pipeline building, those of us who are in the back of house, but we want our patrons to feel special. And I think one of the ways that's worked is it is a major level um, annual, it's leadership level annual giving. It isn't mm -hmm. a membership where we might've been overwhelmed with housekeeping. We are able to really develop relationships with the $1,000 and up donors. That's terrific. Um, so what lesson, what other lessons would you <laughs> listeners of, who are thinking about launching a program like this, especially those who have fundraising programs that are maybe in more of a startup mode? Well, I would say I use that expression still about us. Um, <laughs> so, so many lessons. I, I do think uh, being really clear on why you need the donors, but what the donors need from you, that's crucial. Uh, you know, from my perspective, I had the benefit, and I guess this is maybe career advice more than program advice, of having started my career in very big, very well-established best practices fundraising programs where, yeah, I, I don't even know how many people work in development at those universities. But then I went to a true startup to effectively start a annual fund a professionalize an annual fund and a major gifts program at a school that, that had certainly had robust giving, but really needed a professional program. So I could understand how you can take pieces of best practices with a very small 
staff. Mm -hmm. And there were two of us <laughs> beginning that, a very small staff. So really think about where are your strengths as an institution? How can you execute benefits best with the least amount of effort? Because if you are a startup, you are a small staff, you can't expect to deliver like Harvard, Stanford, the Met. On the other hand, the donors you want are used to Harvard, Stanford, the Met. And mm -hmm. so you need to be able to do the very best you can with the resources you have. Uh, so that's that colors the way we execute our events, the way we communicate. And that's one of the things you and I talk about a lot, you know, where is just good enough so that you can move on to the next execution yeah. of an event of a benefit. Now, <laughs> I started with my shameless plug, I will give a shameless plug that for whether you're starting a program or refining it, bringing in advice, if, if an individual, if a program can afford um, GGNA, it has been invaluable at every step to have the input that's provided by council because they work with other organizations, they can be, uh, you know, arm's length. But I also felt very comfortable reaching out to peer institutions. I think um, maybe especially in the arts, people are a little more nervous about stepping on each other's toes because you know there is a shared affinity. But people have been very gracious in sharing advice. And, and likewise, you know, I'm happy to answer questions about our program because I wasn't the first person to start a patron program <laughs> in the arts. And so you had a lot of experience giving me ideas both on benchmarking so that I could continue to have board involvement. As you said, that was essential. Board members joined right away. Board members have been cheerleaders. They were at our events. They come on our Zooms now. Uh, they joined at leadership level when that was their capacity or you know, at the participation level, if that's their capacity. These kind of little things all add up to allowing for success. So I think for sure, know your opportunities, know your constraints, seek advice wherever you can and have a plan. That would be the other thing. And I will say we lost sight of that a little bit recently. We were going so well. We were working on benchmarking with you and then we had some staff changes and we kind of just drifted. And I noticed year on year, we had great retention, but we didn't grow. And so with our staff rebuilding this year, just pre-pandemic and coming out of it now, we've focused again on where are our goals in terms of membership uh, and the kind of culture of the program. So if, if I can say one more thing, that's not necessarily for a startup, for anyone. As I said, we really had this moment where, oh gosh, we need to recalibrate, we need to grow. And given the environment that we're in today, one of the things we said we really feel we can and ought to change is the diversity of our program. We hadn't been very thoughtful about that when we went out. As I said, it, it, you point out, it was the 30,000 names we pulled out of the database. Mm -hmm. But what about individuals who would love to be part of the Getty program, but maybe aren't our repeat visitors, but when they've come, they've had a great experience. So more recently in January, we had an opportunity to do a challenge match with uh, a trustee. So we took that chance to reach out much more broadly. We advertised on KUSC, the classical radio Radio station associated with USC, and we mailed to a much bigger list of people in our database that were a broader range of zip codes and didn't have that same repeat visitorship, but we thought, why not? It hasn't been as high a penetration, not surprisingly, but we have had a lot of great uh, new membership as a result of being thoughtful that we wanted to expand and where we wanted to expand and how we wanted to expand. Yeah, that's, that's terrific. And, you know, a couple of things that I would highlight from what you shared. Um, first of all, the Getty does have a very sophisticated board and, and major donors um, who are highly engaged at other places, as Janet said, which have really sophisticated, mature programs. So mm -hmm. I think one of the other things that Janet has done and her team have done well is really think through what might be the expectation of what this looked like because they've been involved with, you know, a program that's had a membership program or leadership annual giving for literally a hundred years. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. What would they expect and what, what can we do yeah. to explain this is where we are, this is where we'd like to be, but here are the steps. Yeah. Um, and that's huge. And the other one is really actually trying to anticipate what are some of the policy issues mm -hmm. that we need to think about in the absence of a gift. 
So for instance, you know, Janet talked about, um, you know, not a very long history of things outside of maybe exhibition support at the Getty. And of course it's most famous bequest. Um, <laughs> There's that, yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, thinking about, you know, the gift acceptance policies and naming policies and, and what were not covered because it just hasn't been part of the Getty's yeah. history. And I think that's helped you a, a lot, Janet, because then when, she, when Janet and her team or Jim are in conversation with donors, they, they've already actually thought through a lot of these things and they've engaged the board. Yeah, I, I you know, I think uh, alongside what you're talking about, one of the things I had to figure out is what does need my fingerprints and what doesn't, mm -hmm. what can you outsource without diluting culture or delivery of benefits and what, you know, what can you d delegate to someone who you trust very much. Yeah. Obviously that's one great reason to have counsel because a lot can be done for you and then, you know, tweaked if it isn't exactly you. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, that was essential for us. As you said, having gift acceptance policy, having a lot of that infrastructure, I mean, for, for someone who's in a true startup the way we are, building infrastructure as you're building pipeline, because, I mean, you know, you, you worked with me on structuring a, a recent multi-million dollar gift that began with someone who came to one of our patron kind of events to welcome potential patrons. It was one of our very first ones. This person almost seemed like they kind of wandered in. They they <laughs> came from a hike. So, you know, a lot of people were coat and tie. It was We didn't have patrons at that time. It was really prospective patrons that we invited. And I can't recall how we identified the people uh, to invite from that 30,000. So maybe some of them had joined the patron program very early on in, in April, I think four years ago. So he and his wife came and I remember chatting with him. Well, he joined at actually the 5K level. A wonderful, so kept coming, kept engaging, ended up getting to know one of our curators, joined that support council, blah, blah, blah. Certainly many steps, many touch points along the way and now recently made made a multi-million dollar gift. So it's sort of a, a wonderful four year journey. Yeah. And it wouldn't have been possible if I didn't have the bandwidth for that program. Yeah. So yeah. that meant someone else had to actually author the gift acceptance policy. Yes, I had to you know, yeah. <laughs> work on it and finalize it. But knowing that I could keep relationship front of my mind or as much as I can, that's been essential because I don't think I would have gotten to know this person if I was kind of phoning it in with the annual fund and focusing just on existing major donors. Yeah. And Janet, with that, I would say you probably touched on the most challenging thing that faces the directors of our small programs, how to balance the need to engage with donors. So you, you know, here's Here's Janet's example, four years spent really working to cultivate with colleagues, engage this couple. They went from their first gift of $5,000 to several million dollars. So um, yeah. as hard as it is to keep the focus on donor work, it does pay off. It does. And I think another lesson for me, and I'm still learning all of the lessons I'm talking about, but <laughs> coming from a university, you know, if, if my culture, if I learned fundraising in a university setting where I think some universities even more than where I trained, there's this culture of these are my prospects. So you don't touch my prospects and you can't be that way in a small program, especially if you're in the leadership level. But it's wonderful. I am very lucky to have a great team, very hardworking, very committed, very kind of all in on what we're doing. But the person who started as our patron program concierge, who has himself grown in the relationship over years and is now our patron program manager, he has a relationship with this donor. I have a relationship with the donor. So does our director of uh, development programs. You you do yourself a service if you engage your entire team with your effort, because then yeah. the donor feels good. It's really at the end of the day. I mean, that goes back to the patron program too. I didn't launch our first patron event by saying, welcome to the donor pipeline. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Many of you will be major donors someday. <laughs> if this I have my way. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's more, you know, join the Getty family, be part of this and 
if if you are lucky, obviously, and you are able to meet the right people and engage them with the work. So that's one thing I, I should add, and I know we're running out of time, that we try to be really creative and thoughtful where the patron program money goes. And we all know money is fungible. And so we could say it's going to, you know, a new supply of paper towels. But uh, we've tried to think about a variety of activities that would engage donors. It's ranged from actually making some acquisitions, which we were hesitant about, but interesting kind of more affordable acquisitions, exhibition support, because it's really fun for the patrons to walk up and see you know, with support from the patron program, that's them and we do events around it. Uh, more recently, a program we had that's post baccalaureate, uh, conservation fellows uh, from diverse backgrounds. So it was really fun to be able to announce that in our donor newsletter featuring, this is your support for two years in a row have brought these kids into the field with these young adults into the field. And now we are out of time, but this year, again, it was one of your colleagues who helped me structure this idea. We've actually uh, let our patrons know we are allocating all patron revenue to a fund that Getty started that has grown considerably from Getty's initial um, investment, but a fund to help arts organizations in Los Angeles recover from the pandemic because we had already fundraised for the exhibitions that have now been pushed back a year. Mm -hmm. It was an easy opportunity. I know that's a privileged place to be able to say we're, we're giving the money away this year, but it's the idea of engaging in something meaningful for an organization that itself is struggling to say your patron dollars will help us survive next year. And in fact, that's what we hope our patrons will get to know some of the 80 recipients and help them as patrons as well. But well, and it's, it's a terrific reflection of what the Getty is all about as true. a grantor as well. And I, what I love about the examples, and as you said, you've really each year said, this is what the patron program is supporting. You've really highlighted different parts of the program. And in fact, this year, it's the granting part of the program. So it is consistent with your mission. Yeah, that's a great point. I think for us, we did want people to know it isn't just a museum. Mm -hmm. uh, we are an organization with global reach, with global expertise, and uh, a mission that includes philanthropy to other arts organizations. Thank you. Well, Janet, thank you so much. I, I can see in the Q&A the little red button that we have a bunch of questions that we will answer for folks on our website. Um, it's, as always, uh, so great to, to be with you. Um, I want to thank Janet, the GGNA team that produces these webinars, and of course, all of you for joining us. Um, again, please, if you haven't submitted your questions via the Q&A button, please submit them via our website. And I invite you to um, connect with me, with Janet, or with GGNA via LinkedIn. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you, Janet. It's always great to be with you. Thank you so much, Susanna. It was really fun. Have a great day. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone.